Hello and welcome to this lecture on the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory and the immune systems. And in this lecture we're also going to talk about the anatomy and physiology of the influenza virus and a little bit about the cold, the rhinovirus. And then finally we'll round out the lecture by talking about herbal medicine and the places where the herbal medicine, our plant friends, actually interface with our body to help us when we have a cold and flu. And before we get started, I thought I'd offer a couple of pointers about my teaching style and how you might get the best out of this lecture. I tend to speak in metaphor and tell a story and kind of paint a picture. So if while you're listening to this, if you could just try to get the whole big picture and think of us as a, on a first date with these two systems. And so on this first date, you might just listen to the names of the anatomical structures and then, you know, jot down the vocab words. But remember, you can always come back and uh, look at the video again to catch things you might have missed. And when I put up diagrams and I draw them on the board, I'll pause in the video and you can pause as well so that you can draw the structures yourself. And then the last thing for you to know is that there's a diagram at the end uh, up on the wipey board. And uh, I put a PDF file up so that you can just download it. And if you want to fill in the parts where the herbs interface, you can do that on your own. So thank you for joining me and I hope you enjoy this lecture and I look forward to seeing and hearing from you soon. So welcome to this first class of AMP where we're gonna look at the healthy body and how we respond to colds and flu. And I thought before we got too far into this, I would give you some helpful hints about how to do well in this class. I would say get a notebook, pen and a paper, if you like to do that, or if you're sitting at your computer and you like to type notes, it would just be good to just have something where you can jot things down. And the other thing to think about is, let's just listen to this as a story. You're gonna be able to watch this as many times as you want to. So just listen for the story and don't worry about memorizing and getting every single detail of all the vocab words because that'll come later. So let's just get started. And what I wanna start with is kind of a question. Um, what our perception is about pathogens or disease, and most people have the misconception that the, you know, that the little virus, the influenza virus, actually causes the flu. And yes and no, yes it causes the flu, but it has to be under the right conditions, because if someone walked into your classroom and sneezed, and who had the flu, and just blew sneeze juice all over the room, not every single person in the class would get the flu that it would be the people that have some compromise in their immune system or their respiratory system. So we're just gonna have that be clear that you have all these things in, already in place that are happening all the time that are defending you. And it's really, I, I believe that if you know what the system is and what's happening, then as an herbalist you can think about how the herbs and the medicines that you're giving are gonna interface with this. So just, making it clear that I don't actually fully believe in the germ theory by itself. It has to be the right environment for us. And the other thing is that there are pathogens all over the place and the other component along with our internal environment is, well, how virulent is the pathogen? How strong is it? And in the case of the flu, it's actually not very virulent. It's not very strong. Most people don't get the flu. Those aren't the people that show up in our office. So we're gonna take it from there. So what I thought we would start with is the system that is impacted by the flu is the respiratory system. So we're gonna do a little bit of anatomy of the respiratory system and a little bit of anatomy of the um, immune system. Then we're gonna look at the influenza virus and how it likes to work. And then we're gonna finish with where the herbs interact and how they interact with, with all this anatomy and physiology. So the respiratory system 
we have in place because we are no longer a single celled organism. So we can't exchange gas from the environment. We're not a frog, we can't really breathe through our skin. So we have this whole system that's designed to bring in air, bring in oxygen, and put it into a membrane where it can diffuse across into the blood. And from there, we then exhale carbon dioxide. Other functions of the respiratory system along with this exchange of gas is olfaction or smell. It's also um, taste, a little bit of taste, and it's also uh, expelling waste products and vocalization. So that's the overview. We're going to spend most of our time talking about the tubes that conduct the air. So how does, what are the organs of the respiratory system? Let's see. They're um, the nose, the nasal cavity. And if I were to draw your nasal cavity head on, I would remove the, the cartilage, and you'd have this plate. So all of our stuff that sticks out of the nose is gone. And there are these little shelves that are actually kind of curved underneath. These are called the nasal concha. And the air comes in and it actually circulates around these tunnels that are covered with mucus. And the function of the nose is to actually warm the air and moisten it as it comes in. And it moistens it so much that people who have a, a tube put in, a breathing tube put in, um, if it's not, if the air isn't moisturized that comes in, it actually dries the lungs out so much that they crack, they crackle. So that's what the nose does, is it, it filters and warms the air. It's a resonating chamber for sound. So the air comes in here, and there's hairs that will trap things. And then it goes into, we like to call it the funnel, but the pharynx. It's basically the tube that connects the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. And then it goes right into the windpipe, which is the trachea. And you know, trachea is around 15 inches long. And it has these bands of C-shaped cartilage rings. And if you, while you're sitting there, just feel your trachea, you can actually do it gently. You can actually feel the rings of cartilage. And so this is looking at it head on. Trachea is also called the windpipe. And um, these C-shaped rings, meaning it's open in the back, the cartilage ring doesn't um, isn't complete because the esophagus sits behind here. And I like to joke that if you eat a giant Dorito and it pushes, it can actually extend the esophagus in a little bit, push into the trachea a little. Functions of that cartilage ring is to actually keep the windpipe open. So the air travels down and then it splits into two what we call primary bronchi. And these primary bronchi also have cartilage rings. And it's here that they actually then go into the two lungs, the two structures that we know as lungs. But we'll just keep drawing. Primary bronchi branch, then they go into the different lobes of the lungs. And these are considered um, secondary bronchi. It's, it's a high, high uh, nomenclature here. And then they split again, and those are tertiary bronchi. And then they get smaller, and they're called respiratory bronchioles, and then terminal bronchioles, and then we get to the alveolar ducts, which we're going to get to. Don't worry about all this vocab. This is also called the bronchial tree, and this is where I like people to look at a real tree outside. Because when, especially now in the winter, when you look at a tree, that trunk is the trachea. And then if it's a nice big oak tree or a maple tree, maybe there's two big branches that come off and you get the primary bronchi. And then you just keep watching that fractal, that repeating pattern, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you get all the way out to the leaves. And the leaves, the job of a leaf, is to exchange gas. And that's what our little alveoli are. At the way, 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 the smallest little structure in the lung, they exchange the gas. They look like, if, if I had some grapes here, like if I hold up the stick of clump of grapes, all the little grapes are the alveolus, and then these are the little respiratory bronchioles that hold them. 
the whole function of everything on the board to right here is to just conduct air. Let's bring the air to the place that we're going to do exchange. All of these, so trachea has C-shaped rings, the bronchi have O-shaped rings and they just stay open, open, open all the way down to the terminal bronchial. At some point way down here, there's no more rings and what happens is every time you exhale, the structures that don't have rings actually collapse. The other thing about all these bronchi is that there's smooth muscle around the tube so we can do what's called bronchioconstriction or bronchiodilation. So if you're allergic to dust and you inhale some dust, your bronchi will actually constrict because they say, oh, it's dangerous, don't let that in. And that's going to have an effect when we get to talking about the flu. So there's the whole bronchial tree. And all of these structures from the bronchi fit into the lung. And the lung itself is about the space that the lungs occupy is about one to two square feet, so about this big. And 90% of the lung is air and blood. Only 10% are all of these structures that we're talking about. The lung tissue is so beautiful, it's really light and fluffy. Um, I had a chance to get some, some, a student gave me some pig lungs and I used it in class for a dissection and then I put it in the freezer and when I took it out of the freezer it was so, it was like styrofoam, it was so light. Okay, so they fit in one to two square feet. Now here's some fun factoids. We breathe in and out 10 liters of air per minute. That's two and a half gallons of air that you're moving in and out of your lungs per minute. The lungs, the alveolus receive five liters, the, the whole content of all your blood per minute. There, because this is where we're going to exchange from the little alveolus into the blood. Okay, other fun factoids. It takes four to five seconds to fill and empty the lungs. So it's, and this is all at rest. This is, you're just sitting there watching this video, breathing quietly. Okay. At a cellular level, we, we talked about this is where the exchange is going. The other thing to know is inside that one to two square feet, if I laid all the capillaries together end to end, it would be over a thousand miles of capillaries. It's huge. And in that one to two square feet, the surface area available for exchange is the size of a tennis court. It's about 1,700 square feet. So you might go, wait. This, all this tissue, one to two square feet, how can there be the size of a tennis court for exchange? And it's because of the arrangement of all these grapes. It's not one big water balloon or one big balloon, it's many little teeny tiny grapes that increase the surface area that's available for exchange. Okay, so from here, let's talk about what's happening at the exchange.